A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. An important scientific innovation rarely makes its way by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. It rarely happens that Saul becomes Paul. What does happen is his opponents gradually die out, and that the following generation is familiarized with the ideas from the beginning, another instance of the fact that the future lies with the youth. Max Planck, 1950. Well, hello, and welcome back to the next episode of Dedunking. Now, in this episode, I want to talk about archaeological bias and actually what it means to a layman like ourselves, us that are in the uh, lost civilization community, and how that differs from the people in the archaeological community and how they would interpret something like that, and then give some examples for the archaeologist types to see what we're talking about. Because, as is the case with many scientific terms, we really are talking past each other here. If you talk to an archaeologist and you say, hey, do you know what archaeological bias is? Their immediate thing that they're going to think of is research bias or an even more nefarious bias. Um, research bias being like, uh, well, like take the Great Pyramids, for example. Um, there's lots of pyramids in Egypt, but the three ones on Giza are the ones that are most well known. So they're also the ones that are the most studied. They're the ones that have way more documentation about them. This is a form of research bias. The more popular it is, the more people go check it out. Nan Madal gets completely neglected, while other sites like Encore get far more attention, even though they're fairly near each other. Anyway, the other type of bias that an archaeologist would discuss would be a more nefarious ism type of bias. The uh, most notorious examples of that would probably be those angry windmill boys from Germany back in the day. Yeah, they like to do a lot of uh, archaeology and attach a lot of isms to it. Now to us pyramidiots, we're referring to something else entirely. We're referring to the tendency of mainstream archaeology and archaeologists to defend the status quo of their field. Now there's a lot of reasons these kinds of things happen. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, one that kind of shows an overlap between both of our definitions, their definition of research bias and our definition of archaeological bias, and then another example or two of just like the, the way that archaeological bias ends up painting the view of the individuals involved in the field. In the late 18th and early 19th century, deism was a very common worldview for the well-educated people to hold. It was a, It's basically a belief that God created everything and then walked away and doesn't touch anything anymore. This is where you got like the Jeffersonian Bible, for example. Now, when the theory of evolution came along, deism kind of lost its last reason to be there. The only real reason that deists considered God having been existing at all was because there was this apparent look of design you know it looks like a rabbit's made to get away from a fox and it looks like a fox is made to catch a rabbit so it looked like somebody designed these things the theory of evolution got rid of that no at that point we were in the early days of the three sciences that involved digging in the dirt really the paleontology archaeology and anthropology and there's other ones but those are the three that i'm going to talk about here those three found themselves immediately fighting against creationist types, Noah's Ark. I mean, hell, look at Ken Ham today. You can still find the creationist museums. And they, 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 this is a battleground that they've had since day one of these sciences. And as a result, they've gotten to the point where there's a pretty big knee-jerk reaction to things like Noah's Flood, which they're going to call any talk about a global cataclysm, Noah's Flood. That's like their knee-jerk to it. Anything that would prop up a biblical position as opposed to a scientific one is something they've been inoculated against for a very, very long time. Also, guys like Milo uh, from Mini Minute Man, he's a climate scientist, and this dovetails pretty heavily with people that are climate science deniers. So, same kind of thing. They're just like, no, 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 no. Anybody who's seen an atheist versus creationist debate will know this kind of dynamic where they just completely are going to dismiss. I don't even want to think about what you have to say because I just know you're fucking wrong. Now, what this ends up doing is it causes certain things to be ignored. There are certain things that just, they're just not going to get the proper scientific research because it's kind of a career killer. 
why are you even interested in that shit to begin with? Did you get this degree to come in here and shoehorn creationism and intelligence design into all the textbooks? Is that why you're here? They can find themselves under a lot of scrutiny just for researching the wrong thing. And I'm going to give you a great example of that with Petrie's drill core number seven. These drill cores are pretty famous, especially in people who know anything about ancient Egypt. And they have been since 1883 when Sir Flanders Petrie first popularized them. Drill core number seven being the most famous and the most scrutinized, it's still with us today. And plaster casts have been made and people have still sometimes look into it. But the last scientific article I could find was from 1983 and it was actually a magazine article i can find a couple of books that have talked about it but they all basically reference these these guys' research and the research was somewhat inconclusive they kind of started down a path and it's a lot of work man <laughs> it's a lot of work drilling into granite and so i was doing more research i found an article from 2015 so i thought this looks promising but it took me to vixra which is a place that is known for pseudoscience it's known for non being peer-reviewed it's a place that articles that have already been rejected go so so let's be clear here in the lost civilization community there are tons of people talking about this but the archaeologists, they're not really talking about this. This is the kind of thing that they turn up their nose at. It's like, eh, this is woo. Either you go into it with the intention of debunking those pyramid idiots, which is kind of bad science, right? You don't want to go into something with a predetermined idea of exactly how you want it to be. Or you go into it with your colleagues looking at you like, dude, why the fuck do you even care, man? What are you, what are you doing here? So it is a career killer. Now, that's my guess. I'm not an archaeologist, but... Given that these kinds of things seem to happen a lot, I, I would wager that I'm on the right track here. And then you end up with very real research bias, even though this is extremely famous. And everybody that's watching this video has probably heard of Petrie's drill cores that he's pulled out of ancient Egypt. But there's fucking almost nothing written about them. There's very little actual archaeological work done. And so what does that leave? We get fuckers like Chris Dunn who come in there and tell us that we did it with Sonic. Now, I may well alienate some potential subscribers here, but I got to say my piece on this. All of that hypersonic stuff is woo. I'm sorry. I can get a Casio keyboard, 500 bucks worth of speakers, and I can make way more tones than any 5,000 people in the ancient days ever could have. And I can do it louder, thicker, higher frequencies, lower frequencies. It doesn't take anything anymore for us to do all kinds of shit with that. And we still aren't able to push blocks up in the sky and all kinds of shit. So, sorry, that stuff's woo. But back to the drill core. If somebody was to take it on themselves and they were going to do the research on that drill core, and they were like, holy shit, you know what I just found out? This thing that confirms that Graham Hancock and his Pyramidiot buddies are right. There is something here. They used fucking steam power to cut this thing, all right? Um, career's dead. Game, set, match. This guy, he's done. You make an amazing avant-garde discovery. There's a strong possibility you're going to end up like Hugh Everett. Hugh Everett the third was an American physicist who first proposed the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. In contrast to the then dominant Copenhagen interpretation, the many worlds interpretation posits that the wave function never collapses and that all possibilities of a quantum superimposition are objectively real. Discouraged by the scorn of other physicists for modern worlds interpretation, Everett ended his physics career after completing his PhD. Afterwards, he developed blah, 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 blah. Although largely disregarded until the near the end of his lifetime, the modern world's interpretation received more credibility with the discovery of quantum decoherence in the 1970s and has received increased attention in recent decades, becoming one of the mainstream interpretations of quantum mechanics. Now, in the lost civilization community, we've seen this play out really hardcore with Gobekli Tepe, for example. When it was dated, it was like a huge surge through our community because Graham Hancock had been predicting this shit for 20 years. A lot of people had been predicting this shit for a long time. And a lot of archaeologists had basically pegged that as this is what you need. You need to show me that some other culture was moving megaliths 10,000 years ago. You do that and we'll start talking about these. And of course, rather than do that, archaeology actually rewrote the fucking book 
on how human civilization works. Oh, well, you know, it used to be that we thought you had to have a surplus of food before you had enough manpower to do this, but I guess not. I mean, dude, literally, it, it, we see that and we're just like shaking our heads. We're like, okay, I, I pretty obvious what's going on here from our perspective. Another great example of this kind of thing is you will consistently hear now, you'll quite frequently hear people like Mini Minuteman here say this. Milo, what would be the one piece of evidence that would change your mind on Hancock's theory? Interesting. That's a phenomenal question. Um, I would say, wow, yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good one. I think that we would need to see something a lot more centralized. So a lot of what uh, Hancock shows uh, throughout his series is evidence of cultures that were influenced by this alleged parent culture, um, where Hancock never actually shows any evidence of the parent culture itself. Um, now, he does go to the Bimini Road, which is something that I don't believe is an anthropological or archaeological site. Um, so what I would need to see in order to actually believe that his theory has any credence is evidence of this parent culture itself. That's an extremely common position right now. Ask them where the Sea Peoples came from. For those of you who aren't aware, at the end of the Bronze Age, the Sea Peoples are this mysterious bunch of people that just came in, kicked ass, took names, fucked everything up and left. And cause a huge fucking economic and societal collapse. Just destroyed fucking all of Mesopotamia, North Africa, Mediterranean. Just fucked everything up. Written about by a bunch of different people. We don't even have a single helmet. Single sword. Single pit of riding. There's not one fucking coin. Not one screw that came off of one of their boats. But all these archaeologists will accept that these guys existed because they're written about all over the place. Kind of like these civilizing heroes that show up in fucking South America and in Egypt and in ancient Greece. <laughs> Easter Island. Dude. So from our perspective, this is kind of like, on the one hand, we you show extreme incredulity. On the other hand, it's like, well, yeah, obviously they existed. I mean, people wrote about them, right? The writings about the Sea Peoples very much are contradictory, but that's typical of shit from back then. Nationalism played a big part, blah, blah, blah. My point is, this is another example of what we would consider archaeological bias. This is assumed to exist off of the same evidence that this is not assumed to exist. And that's... Again, I get it because I understand where it's coming from, the old, the old world knee-jerk reaction against the creationists and whatnot, but um, we've reached a point where it's actually doing more harm than good at this point. You don't know how easy it is for somebody to come into this community, take one look at the two to three minutes per brick on the Great Pyramid and be like, dude, I can't even fucking build a wall in my backyard that fast. Are you kidding me? And next thing you know, two weeks later, they're telling you how the moon landing's a hoax and fucking man-made climate change is fake and the Earth's only 6,000 years old. And that's kind of on you guys to a degree. The archaeological community by you guys. Instead of, you're the one saying this a two to three minutes and, and digging your fucking heels in, even though every single person who's ever laid a brick in their life will tell you that is insane. I've got one little thought experiment before I close, and I just want to put this one out to the archaeologists and the skeptics out there, any of you that are still watched me this far. I'm sure you guys are aware of what the Antikythera mechanism is, right? Complicated gears, call it kind of clockwork even, okay? And I'm sure you're also aware of what the alio pile is. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Very rudimentary steam engine, wrote, around, wrote about about 200 years after uh, the Antikythera mechanism was supposed to have been made. Now, historians maintain that the Aleopile was never anything more than a toy. Now, archaeologists will tell you that the ancient people were not simple, that they weren't stupid, that they had the same brains that we do. But then they're going to try to tell us that these people that had had to spin a stick to start a fire... All their life, they've watched their bread be made by a two stones spinning in a circle. They've realized it's a whole lot easier to have a, an ox push that stone in a circle than themselves. You're going to tell me they're not going to recognize the inherent fucking power of something going spinning fucking faster than anything they've seen spin in their entire life? <laughs> did what I just, So yeah, I'm saying that they probably did something with steam power. Does that sound like woo to you? Why? Why?
they had complicated gears they had a steam engine why is it woo for them to put the two together all right and if you did make it this far thank you very much please like and subscribe and do all those fancy things that all the big boy youtubers get oh and by the way quick shout out to milo from mini minute man he is actually a really cool guy i made a little community post about it um check it out i'll put a link but just go to my community tab and click on it if you we've had a pretty good conversation and i've gained a lot of respect for that young man uh he's he's got a bright future ahead of him he's 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 got a He's got a lot of integrity and a pretty sharp brain. Thank you very much. You guys have a good night. We have a fucking infinitesimal amount of the information. Yeah. We have so little that if you were trying to postulate this idea of a global world, you know, a ruling civilization, you would not have enough pieces to be able to do it, even if it did exist.